This episode is brought to you by Blinkist. Confession time. As much as I love talking about things like highbrow cinema and philosophy, after a long day of working in the content mines, I just want to sit down and watch a bunch of real estate agents argue about completely pointless drama. Over lies, over falseness, over things that I don't understand or agree with. And I'm not alone in that, as more than half of Americans watch reality TV. And nearly 50% of television is now unscripted. We're flocking to hits like The Great British Baking Show, Vanderpump Rules, or Love is Blind to see normal people's authentic reactions to extraordinary scenarios. Whether they're baking a princess cake, falling in love, or, spoilers, telling off Tom Sandoval. I regret ever loving you. Another confession, I've never watched Vanderpump Rules, but people just talk about this stuff all the time. So if you have opinions on Tom Sandoval, let us know. Ostensibly, the draw of reality TV should be its authenticity. People reacting unscripted to wild situations. But as our thirst for realness increasingly dictates our viewing habits, it's gone well beyond the baking tent to pervade most aspects of modern life. Now, we all want to be real. And yet, as our search for authenticity deepens, why do we all seem to feel further removed from reality? Well, let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, is authenticity fake? Okay guys, before we get into it, I wanna give a shout out to this video sponsor, Blinkist. I'm sure many of you are like me in two ways. One of those ways is you like books a lot and you wanna learn about a lot of different things. The other thing is you're very busy and often quite tired, so have a hard time getting through all those books. Blinkist is an app that helps you get the most important information from a library of over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts. And they help you get all this information, and you're not gonna believe this, only 50 minutes. That means when you're driving to run an errand on your way to work, taking the bus, you can download information into your brain from a library of lots of great books. Now, one of the books that I checked out on Blinkist, which is one of my favorites, is Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Foucault is a French philosopher that kind of operates in the post-Marxist tradition, and he has an amazing analysis of systems of control in society. We've talked about him a lot on the channel before, and I think many of you would really dig his ideas. So if you try Blinkist out, maybe start with that. And it feels pretty great to get your head around some of Foucault's big ideas without having to read hundreds of pages of difficult French philosophy. Another feature that I am personally very excited about is called Blinkist Spaces. Now this is a feature that allows you to create a space with friends or family where you can recommend titles to each other. Now all the members of a shared space can access all of the titles in that space with or without a Blinkist premium subscription. And I'm really excited about this because I have friends that live all over the country that I'd kind of love to read a book with, talk about ideas with, and with Blinkist Spaces, it makes it easier to do that. So if this sounds good to you and you want to spend some of the limited time that I know you have, because we're all busy, learning a lot via a library of very good books and podcasts, check out Blinkist. Now you can go to Blinkist.com slash Wisecrack. And if you do, you can get a seven day free trial and 25% off your premium account. Again, that's Blinkist.com slash Wisecrack, 25% off, seven day free account. What is there to lose? And again, if you want to be like me, maybe start with Michel Foucault and then jump in the comments and we can talk about discipline and punish. But speaking of people that Foucault read, let's get back to talking about Marx. For as long as pretentious dudes have used the phrase, well, as a philosopher, they've been asking questions about what reality is. This is what we call metaphysics or what we can know about reality. That's what we call epistemology. Now, in other words, they've long wanted to establish what's real and in more human terms, what's authentic. Now, the problem with the former trying to figure out what's real is that we're never objective observers, but always particular individuals with specific perceptions of unique situations. In other words, a lady I see being sawed in half is not actually being sawed in half as an angry magician has explained to me multiple times. But authenticity, on the other hand, has more to do with the reality or truth of oneself. This is what's going on when Sartre says that existence precedes essence, meaning that our human subjectivity or identity isn't some objective metaphysical concept, but something we create through existing. But it turns out that doing you 
is harder than it sounds and requires some additional clarification. Now, French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau theorized that personal authenticity or the natural self is diminished by the need for social validation from external forces like hierarchy, inequality, interdependence, or the plastics. Get in, loser, we're going shopping. Basically, it's harder to be authentic when others are watching. Like how when my wife walks into the room during the workday, I pause the episode of Always Sunny I'm watching and quickly grab the nearest book. Martin Heidegger added that authenticity and inauthenticity are interdependent. They're both basic forms of existing in the world. However, he believed that individuals can achieve personal authenticity by choosing their own identity in spite of societal pressure. Like when Katie breaks the crown at prom. Seriously, most people just take the crown and go. Now, Albert Camus believed that because the universe we live in is absurd, meaningless, and doesn't care about us, the only way for each person to fill that meaning void is through authentic self-realization, or by creating their own meaning, which makes sense as he was a drinking buddy of Sartre. Now, a common thread for some philosophers is that authenticity is a dynamic process of endless becoming in a world that's constantly changing. Authenticity isn't a fixed state. We're constantly in flux between being authentic and inauthentic, depending on the situation. Sartre's term for this inauthenticity was bad faith, the sort of denial of freedom. Okay, so reality is the metaphysical idea of what's actually true. And authenticity is the ever-changing existential reality of who we're trying to be. Now, whether it's because of growing ideological divides, political or religious radicalization, or the dangerous influence of postmodern thought, we're living in an age where it feels like we're less in agreement on the nature of reality than ever before. And this has been even more complicated by recent developments in technology, with things like AI that clone the weekend's voice and create art that sold for over $400,000 and generate fake images like this, we can't even trust our own eyeballs or ear holes to tell us what's real. Now this means we have fewer plausibility structures, i.e. strong social consensuses on what we collectively agree to be true. Sociologist Peter Berger explained that in environments where plausibility structures are weak, individuals look inwards for certainty and ground their claims to knowledge and personal experience. We can't find the truth out there, so we look for it in here. Because finding truth in social, political, or digital reality feels increasingly impossible, this can lead us to search for something true or real in ourselves and also in others in the form of reality entertainment. Since its contemporary inception in the early 90s with shows like The Real World and its spin-off Road Rules and then later Survivor, reality TV has skyrocketed. We won't get into this now, but it's also skyrocketed because it costs way less to make and, and the contestants aren't union and it's really cheap for the networks to just give us a bunch of shit. But that's not what this video is about. But I had to say it, I had to. There are plenty of reasons reality TV dominates our screens. The drama, the romance, and moments like this. Psychologist Ava M. Krakow theorized that some people watch these shows to live vicariously through others. She explained, in a way, you can feel like you are benefiting from their life experiences without having to endure negative aspects of them. Of course, this can become a problem when we begin to mistake the reality of our screens with actual reality. These shows are a carefully constructed and therefore false reality. For example, the surface goal of shows like The Bachelor or Survivor is to win, but outwardly playing the game or acknowledging the fourth wall makes us think contestants are fake. Ironically, contestants who are open about wanting more followers are probably being more genuine than contestants who claim they're here for the right reasons. For viewers, it's more fun to believe an average Joe or Jane is looking for their soulmate rather than trying to quit their personal training job to become a full-time influencer. In the end, we don't actually want authenticity. We just want people to act authentic. Amy Hart, a 2019 contestant on Love Island, doesn't believe it's possible to be entirely authentic on reality television because, quote, you're an ordinary person in an extraordinary situation. It's difficult to be your true self when you know you're being watched at all times. Documentarians have long been troubled by the paradox of accurately capturing reality while putting their subjects under the camera's scrutinizing gaze. Now, naturally, contestants curate their on-screen personas to be the best versions of themselves, or in the case of beloved villains, the most outrageous versions of themselves. Just stop, just. Our surveillance of the contestants forces them to surveil themselves, not just for a shot at fame, 
but often out of self-preservation. In the 2010s, reality TV contestants saw a rise in trolling, which led to worsened mental health and an increase in suicides. Contestants have to be hyper aware of how they are being perceived by a public that could turn on them at any second. It's impossible for contestants and hosts to be genuine when they're censoring themselves to avoid or minimize internet backlash. Our expectation for reality TV stars to be real while also under observation is especially unrealistic considering how most people, myself included, craft our online personas. Reality TV's surveillance culture bleeds into social media and impacts our ability or inability to be authentic online. Social media has been influenced by reality TV in that we, as British American journalist John Ronson points out, are creating a culture where people feel constantly surveilled, where people are afraid to be themselves. We're not just watching reality TV stars. We're watching each other and being watched. People go to the internet because they want to explore their own identity alongside billions of others trying to do the same. But at the same time, we all curate our profiles, posts, and tweets to present the best version of ourselves while avoiding anything that could get us shamed or called out. Our very notion of authenticity has been reinforced by influencers who are successful at turning it on for the camera. Researchers have found that people generally feel their most authentic when they act like a cross between the perfect party guest and the perfect coworker. I don't know, my perfect party guest is the one who doesn't show up. My perfect coworker is all of my coworkers because they're all perfect in their own special ways, except the one who I don't like. Instead of feeling like their true self by acting in accordance with their values, people feel most at home when they conform to a set of socially approved qualities, like being extroverted, funny, and charismatic. But like, let's be honest, guys, what are the odds that we're all that person? If I'm being honest, I feel most myself when I'm hanging out in a very small group of friends where we can talk about things we're interested in and, and be weird and I can express my own sense of humor without weirding anyone out. And there's probably good snacks there as well. That's, that's probably it for me. In trying to be authentic, we're just chasing the ideal of who society tells us we should be. This makes the whole process of mining for authenticity feel like it ends in fool's gold. And I like really feel this sometimes because if I look at the post online of writers, musicians, and creative folks that I follow, it's hard to not want my life to look like theirs. And it's easy to forget that lots of these social media posts and videos are manufactured to make these people's lives look a certain way to get enough clicks to continue to monetize those cool lifestyles. It's a real head Social media and reality TV aren't the only mediums distorting reality. Advertisers, the epitome of inauthenticity, encourage us to be real and claim their products and brands are genuine. Let's take Coca-Cola's famous It's the Real Thing campaign from the 1970s, which was not in fact developed by Don Draper. That's just from a TV show. Ira C. Herbert, the brand manager at the time, celebrated it as a new direction that responds to research which shows that young people seek the real, the original, and the natural as an escape from phoniness. As a result of the success of this and other campaigns, one of the most powerful marketing tools today is brand authenticity, which is the extent to which we as consumers perceive a brand to be faithful and true toward itself and us, and to support us being true to ourselves. And it's easy to over-identify with a brand you love. I'll be honest, two brands I've liked a lot in my life. So I like sneakers and I like guitars a lot, and I've always liked Nikes, and I've always liked Fender guitars. There are other sneakers that are just as good as Nikes that are maybe made more ethically. There's other guitars that play better and are a better value and also maybe made more ethically than Fenders, but from a young age, I liked them, and it's just like in my consciousness now. It's almost like my subjectivity has been shaped uh, by neoliberal capitalism such that I can only exist and be true if my selfhood is mediated via brands that are you know, traded on the open market. It's almost like that. Marketing firms need to convince consumers they're authentic, but all we're really getting is the illusion of authenticity. More perniciously, all of these factors have worked together to normalize surveillance culture, a direct threat to authenticity. Surveillance is everywhere in modern life, especially in social realms meant to be fun and entertaining, like Twitter or TikTok. Instead of being afraid of being watched by others, some people feel more valued when they know someone is watching them. 
One of the many problems with constant surveillance is that we all become performers and our communities become our audiences. Like influencers, each of us crafts a personal brand. In this way, we're pigeonholing our identity. And this makes our interactions less about making genuine connections and more about marketing who we want people to think we are. At best, being under constant surveillance inhibits our ability to be authentic. And at worst, it makes it nearly impossible. Sociologist Steve Fuller argues that true authenticity comes from being open-minded and having the freedom to try things, go back to the drawing board, and try something else. Inconsistency is accepted with the understanding that each individual tries on different masks to figure out what feels true to them. Under surveillance culture, it's more difficult than ever to try things on because you could be called out or, or your weird phase will be memorialized for posterity. So instead of being able to experiment with authenticity, we're caught performing a safe version of ourselves. It's not actually very authentic. The more we try to show we're real, the less real we become. So is there any way to truly keep it real? Well, according to both Rousseau and Camus, real human identity is about constant interrogation and reflection on a self that is perpetually in flux. No one ever arrives at their authentic self. There's never a point at which we are done growing. And this is a good thing because within each of us are multiple identities that are dependent on the roles we hold in society. Like me, I'm a producer at Wisecrack. I'm a husband and also a member of just one of the sickest Grateful Dead cover bands in all of Southern California. In any given situation, we might lean into a different aspect of our identity, and that's totally normal. It's frustrating that our true selves aren't something we could identify with a Harry Potter house quiz, astrology, or enagrams. But maybe the idea that our authenticity is something we get to create can be freeing. And according to novelist Jenny Teller, being inauthentic isn't inherently bad either. She argues that sometimes we have to be inauthentic for society to function. She believes you only truly lose your authenticity when you become loyal to an external concept you adopt without reflecting on it. They fly at a stopover on the brain slug planet. Hermes liked it so much he decided to stay of his own free will. Like uh, if you get caught up in the manosphere without realizing how much of it depends on glorifying violence and misogyny. My point is that attaching your authenticity or your perception of yourself to an online persona is just as dangerous as identifying as just an American or just a Gemini or just a Gryffindor because it reflects an unwillingness to grow. The real threat to authenticity is a lack of reflection on your beliefs and actions. Sartre said, if you seek authenticity for authenticity's sake, you are no longer authentic. Much like happiness, the more we focus on trying to be authentic, the more elusive it becomes. Philosopher Naomi Golder recommends living a life of reflection and committing to things you care about without worrying too much about whether you're being authentic or not. The less you worry about it, the more likely you are to achieve it. Or as my third grade teacher, Miss Estes used to say, be yourself because everyone else is taken. But what do you all think? Is it possible to be authentic in a world that's increasingly inauthentic? Or is keeping it real beside the point? Let us know what you think in the comments. I want to say a huge shout out to all of you. And this is going to sound forced, but it's not for helping us to be so authentic as a channel. And thank you for giving me the space to be authentic on this channel. But a special thanks to our patrons who are just so authentic. You can click a link in the description to check out our Patreon page. It's pretty cool. You get to support us directly. And in exchange, you get on our Discord server, you get videos early with no ads, a bunch of other fun stuff. Check it out. And as always, thanks to all of you for spending time with us, for engaging, for leaving comments, for liking, subscribing, for sharing our videos with people who you think might like them. It really means a lot and helps us a lot. So know that we appreciate it. Um, in the meantime, remember that the best way to keep it real is just falling in love with a corporation. Uh, let us know in the comments which one is your favorite, and we'll see you next time.